Revelation 21, uh, verse number 1, the Bible says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. And God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. There shall be no more death, neither sorrow nor crying, neither shall there be any more pain, for the former things are passed away. And he that sat upon the throne said, Behold, I make all things new. And he said unto me, Write, for these words are true and faithful. Let's pray. Father, we bless you. Thank you for the good singing. Our, our heart was blessed. Lord, thank you for the good testimonies. Again, my heart was blessed. Thank you for hearing and answering prayers. Lord, sometimes you move mountains. And that's a, that's a wonderful thing. But sometimes just doing something simple and small is just as wonderful to our hearts. And so, God, thank you for being so concerned that even the little things you don't overlook. And, God, you do great things. Thank you for touching these people's lives. And, Lord, thank you for hearing and answering prayer. Now, help us illuminate our minds, open our hearts, and, God, speak to us. May, Lord, the Word of God not only bless us, but may it break us, and may it also embolden us to go out and tell a lost and dying world that Jesus is coming soon. Now, Father, have your will and way amongst us tonight. Be with those that are sick. Be with those that are recovering from surgery. Thank you for bringing Jordan and Sheila through their surgeries. And God, I pray for those other needs. You'd move upon them as well. Help us now, and we'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' wonderful name we do pray. Amen. And amen. I want to teach tonight as we finished up last week on the great white throne judgment. Uh, tonight we're going to speak on the heavenlies. If you remember last week we brought out that uh, the heavens and the earth were passed away. That those that stood before the great white throne stood on nothing but the power of God. And you know we, People always say, well, when I meet God, I already know you don't have a leg to stand on when you get there. And we brought all that out last week and showed the earth, eternal damnation of the lake of fire for all those who rejected Jesus Christ. Well, the next installment in eschatology, what will happen after the great white throne, is the, the heavenlies will be exposed. And so let's look at that tonight. First thing I want you to notice is the revealing. Look in verse number 1 again. John, as our eyewitness, John, the instrument that Jesus chose to see these things, uh, who was caught up to the third heaven to see all this that would happen in the future and then sent back to pin it down. John says this. He says, I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Now I, John, saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We see the revealing of three new entities. John says he sees a new heaven. Now he would know because he's been in the abode of God in the what is now the current heaven up until uh, this point. He says, I see a new heaven, I see a new earth, and there is no more sea, and then I see new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Now, he tells us heaven and earth has passed away. We revealed that last week. Then he says, very emphatically, he sees a new heaven, a new earth, and new Jerusalem. That's important because the vast majority of commentators say that God's just going to remake the earth. 
and remake the heaven. Well, that's not what John says. John says the, uh, the earth and the heavens were passed away. They're gone. I don't know about you, but when somebody passes away, they're gone. And then he says, I see a new heaven, a new earth, and new Jerusalem. And that's pretty emphatic. He didn't say he saw remade heaven, or remade earth, and then new Jerusalem. There, can I say this? He uses the same term for all of them. New. So that's very important. He reveals the exciting revelation of God having another genesis, another beginning, newness. You see, when God created the earth and He made a garden named Eden, everything was perfect until man chose to sin. And as we brought out last week, because this earth has been tainted by sin, God's going to destroy it. Because Satan, who's the accuser of the brethren, has been in heaven, he's going to destroy, destroy that. Nothing will have ever touched any of this to defile it, because it's all going to be new. Now, why is there going to be a new heaven, a new earth, and a new Jerusalem? I mean, we sing all them songs about heaven. We don't sing songs about a new earth. Matter of fact, we sing all them songs about heaven, but all them songs we're singing about really isn't about heaven, about new Jerusalem. Hmm? They really are. So why are there three? Well, we could try to spiritualize and say, well, you've got God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Ghost, but that's not going to hold matter either. Because the Godhead's only going to be in one of them. Why are there three? Now let me give you this. If you look at verse number two, he says, There's new Jerusalem prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. We'll bring it out down about verse number 10 in a minute. But new Jerusalem is for the bride of Christ. You remember what Jesus said in John 14? He said, Let not your hearts be troubled. If you believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again, receive you unto myself, that where I am, there you may be also. New Jerusalem is for the bride of Christ. Hallelujah. We're going to a city. Hmm? Like an old song, looking for a city. Abraham was looking for a city whose builder maker is God. We're going to the city. So we have new Jerusalem for the bride of Christ. Well, why is there going to be a new earth? Well, if you look in Psalms 37, 11, and then if you go to the Beatitudes in Matthew chapter 5, down about verse number 5, that great sermon on the mount when Jesus is preaching to uh, uh, those Jews there, he makes this statement. It's found in both passages. That the meek shall inherit the earth. So why is there going to be a new earth? That's for the Jews. The Sermon on the Mount was given to the Jews. People like those Beatitudes and them similitudes, and, and they like to preach that to the church, but you've heard me say the book of Matthew is written to the Jews, not to the church. That message was to the Jews, just like Matthew 24. It wasn't to the church. Who is getting the earth? The Jews. Well, what about the new heaven? Well, that's for the heavenly host. All the angelic beings and uh, uh, the seraphim and the cherubim and uh, all them get the heavens. But hallelujah, we get new Jerusalem. All right? So we see the revealing. All right? And by the way, that's part of things you won't find in any commentaries. Let me show you something else. Notice the residing. I told you. It's not one for the Father, one for the Son, one for the Holy Ghost. No. Look with me in verse 3. 
And I heard a great voice out of heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they shall be his people, and God himself shall be with them and be their God. Where's God going to be? New Jerusalem. Now who is God? God the Father, God the Son, or God the Holy Ghost? Yes. They're all three one. God will dwell in New Jerusalem. I say, what a blessing. We will be in the very abode of God. What a, what a thrill. Hmm? Um, we see the residing. We see the revealing. Notice the removing. Verse number 4 is a wonderful verse. If you don't have this underscored in your Bible, you've never read it. You need to underscore this. This is one of the things that helps us through our journey in this world. Job said in Job 14 that man's days are few and full of trouble. The Bible says that all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Breathing air, you're going to face hardship in this life. Can I help you? Everybody has problems. Now, some people, you're around them 20 seconds, and you know all about their problems. Some people are more private. They don't tell you all about their problems. But can I say, from time to time, everybody has personal problems. Everybody has financial problems. Everybody has pain. Everybody has loss. Everybody suffers something. So the next time you get to having a pity party thinking you're the only one going through something, you're lying to yourself. There are a lot of people going through things. You've heard me say many a times, you never know the pain behind the smiles when people come in the house of God. There are some people that don't air their laundry. But everybody has pain. Everybody has heartache. You say, well, I've suffered more than anybody. You're lying to yourself again. Nobody has suffered like Job suffered. Hmm? And by the way, Job was not indwelled by the Holy Ghost. If you're saved, you are. Job didn't have a complete copy of the Word of God. You do. But can I say, we all suffer. We all hurt. And that's why verse 4 is so wonderful. Look what's removed when we get to New Jerusalem. It said, and God... Notice it didn't say an angel. I don't like busting people's bubbles, but, you know, I do from time to time. I get so tired of folks talking about angels all the time. You can have your angels, I just take the Lord. An angel's never done anything for me. Now, I know he's given an angel charge over me, a guardian angel who watches over me, uh, uh, but can I help you something? The Lord's the one that directed him. The Lord's the one that's done everything for me. An angel didn't die for me. An angel didn't convict me of my sin. An angel didn't save me by his grace. An angel isn't the one going to take me to glory. It's all about the Lord. God Himself, and God shall wipe away all tears from their eyes. You ever shed any tears? You get to New Jerusalem, you'll never shed another one. Hmm? Now, let me help you with something. Uh, I believe it was Dottie Rambo who wrote that song back in the 70s, Tears are language that God understands. The psalmist said, I believe it's Psalms 58, 6, said, Put thou my tears in, your, in a bottle. Are they not in your book? Can I say God records every tear you shed. God knows every heartache you've ever had. And there's coming a day when you just are in the abode of God, you'll never cry anymore because He's going to wipe them away. And by the way, there's nothing to cry about once we get to New Jerusalem. You know, say, He's going to wipe away the tears from our eyes. The Bible says there'll be no more death. What a blessing. Hmm? Is there anybody in here that's never lost a loved one? That's what I thought. We all have lost somebody. I do a little work at the funeral home. You know what I've found? People grieve differently. I've done that in preaching funerals and being there and holding people's hands when they lose somebody. 
and then in working funerals. People grieve differently. But can I say, it's never easy letting somebody go. It leaves something missing in your life. And the sad reality is, if Jesus doesn't come, you know, we're all going to go. And, it's, and, and, and it leaves emptiness in our lives. You know, there are still times when I want to pick up the phone and call my mother and tell her something that one of the kids did. I hope the Lord lets her know. She's been gone now for a while. And, you know, when you lose loved ones, it hurts. But in that song I referred to, Dottie said, There'll be no wreaths of death on my mansion's door. Hmm? There's not going to be any death over there. Huh? Funeral directors are going to be out of business in glory. No graveyards in glory. What a blessing. Hmm? It's removed. Can I help you with something? Death is the wage of sin. You know, people don't always understand when you're dealing with them and their heart's broken and they're asking questions. Why did my loved one die? Why didn't God save them? It has nothing to do with God. It has to do with man choosing to sin. That's why death came. And God's no respecter of persons. If God stepped in to save your loved one from death, he'd have to step in and save everybody's loved ones from death. But you see, when man chose to sin, man's the one that put all that in motion, not God but i got good news. God's going to end death someday. Hmm? There'll be no more death. Look what else is removed. The Bible says, neither sorrow. No more bad days. No more dark clouds. No more singing the blues. No more sorrow. No more crying. Hmm? It says, neither shall there be any more pain. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Right there. Hmm? Anybody never have pain? There are people that have that thing where they don't feel pain. That's actually worse than having pain. Because you have no resistance. You don't know how in harm's way you are. You got your hand over a fire and can't feel the flame. But there's come today we'll have no pain. Hmm? Somebody once said, getting old is not for the weak. Hmm? When you get old, you got pain. Hmm? We can all sit here and talk about our aches and pains. Uncle Arthur visits us all. So who's that? Arthritis. Hmm? I just wish, Brother Clint, back in our ball playing days, I'd have knew then what I know now. It's not worth diving into a brick wall for a ball. That it doesn't matter. That nobody's ever going to remember if you caught it or didn't catch it. But 40 years later, you still remember it because you got the pain from it. There's a lot of things that wisdom teaches us in old age. But you see, there'll be no pe more pain there. Think about it. No more wheelchairs. No more walkers. No more eyeglasses. No more defibrillators in your chest, Brother Bob. Uh, no more any pain. Hey, Caleb, no more cast in heaven. Isn't that a blessing? No more pins in your arm. It's a blessing. No more pain. None. Nothing that will hurt you. No more cataracts. No more hearing aids. Miss Janet, you ought to shout on that. She didn't hear me. That's all right. Huh? No more problems. Because it's all been removed. Boy, that's, isn't, that, isn't that wonderful? Now, don't get caught up where a lot of people get caught up, Brother Donald. They get caught up in verse number 4, and they worship verse 4. We're not going to be worshiping verse 4. We're going to be worshiping the Lamb. And 
a lot of folks talk about heaven. All they want to talk about is verse 4, what we're going to get into here in a little bit. They, uh, we're going to heaven because of the Lamb. Huh? Now, I'll just go ahead and say it because I'll probably forget it when I get down there. But when we get to, up there and there, there are streets of gold and they're transparent, pure gold, we're not going to get down and worship the golden streets. We're going to walk on the golden streets. We're going to worship the Lamb. Hmm? The opulence of the city is just for him to show how much he loves us. But we're not going to worship the city. We're going to worship him. So we see that there is some revealing goes on in this chapter. There's some residing goes on. We're going to reside with him. And he's going to reside with us. There's some removing. But then he gives us a rendering. Or the blueprint for New Jerusalem. And he gives us those insights that makes it into all the Psalms. But this is literally going to be reality. What is about ready to happen? Now, keep in mind, the Apostle Paul penned down that it hasn't even entered into the heart of man what God hath prepared for them that love him. See, Paul too was blessed to get to be caught up into the third heaven. And it was so fascinating, yet so terrifying to Paul that he couldn't even speak about it for 14 years. But Paul said, you have no idea. Your wildest imagination cannot come up with the splendor that you're going to behold. Now that's something. Hmm? To think about. I told, I told you, you're all a little sober tonight. I'm only talking about heaven. But... I've told this story, but it's a true story. I'm going to tell it again. Uh, years ago, before uh, Hillary Clinton's he uh, health initiative took hold, uh, you forget, but when Bill was in office, she was in charge of trying to come up with a nationwide health system. Well, what happened on the local level is people didn't know what the rules were going to be. Because any time gov get, government gets involved, it becomes a mess. So what happened is a lot of uh, smaller doctor's offices started aligning themselves with other doctor's offices because they figured whoever was the biggest would survive. And that's why all of northern Kentucky is St. Elizabeth. They all used to be just individual practices, and they all just joined. You know, used to, you had St. Luke, and, and you had, you know, St. Elizabeth, and you had Booth, and, you know, all those things. Now they're all just St. E, you know. Christ Hospital come in, tried to come in here, and they monopolized them out. And so they're still trying to come in, and they've got a couple of places, you know, here and there. But for the most part, it's all St. Elizabeth. Well, years ago, when Miss Annette's office was just their office, and back then they had six doctors. They did, you know, minor surgeries in the office, x-rays in the office. They did everything right there in the office. And, you know, it was a lot better then. I could go in, get things taken care of, and leave. Now you got to go all over northern Kentucky to see people, huh? But uh, she had one of the doctors that uh, she worked with at the time. He built a new house. He built it down there in, in one of the forts. I think it's Fort Mitchell. And his father-in-law was a builder, so he built this house. And they was having a Christmas party, and they had it at his house. Just got it done. So Nat and I got there a little bit earlier, early, and he takes us in. He's showing us this thing. I mean, he's pulling out the drawers and showing me how the drawers are made and things and all this. And, but uh, in his office... He had marble pillars going into his office. And in his office, uh, all around the top of it was this uh, leafing, looks like it come out of, of, of Rome or something. It was all 24 karat gold leaves all around his office. And then he takes us in this, uh, uh, what we would call, I guess, a great room. The ceilings were about 60 feet. They had mirrors 40 feet over the uh, uh, fireplaces on each end. All the furniture has been imported. In one section of it, there was a fireplace that came from 17th century England. I mean, he's explaining all this stuff. And the house cost $4 million, and it probably cost close to that to furnish it. And keep in mind, his father-in-law was the builder. So if it got builders cost it $4 million, how much do you think this house really cost? That's what I'm trying to say. And we're sitting there. I mean, some of these little nurses at a network, well, they're afraid to sit on the furniture. I mean, this place, I mean, it's, it's a lot. And we're sitting there, and Annette looks at me. She says, what are you doing? I said, I'm fixing a shower. She said, well, you're going to do what? I said, hey, this won't even be a doghouse in heaven. Huh? 
I got to thinking about that verse. It doesn't even enter into the heart of man. I'm thinking, hey, this is nothing compared to what Jesus went to prepare for me. Huh? Well, John's going to give us the blueprint for the rendering of New Jerusalem. Look down at verse number 10. In verse 9 it says, And there came to me one of the seven angels which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me, saying, Come hither, I will show thee the bride, the Lamb's wife. And he carried me away in the Spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem, descending out of heaven from God. And here he's going to give us the blueprints. He says, Having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone most precious, even like a jasper stone, clear as crystal, and had a wall, great and high, and had twelve gates, and at the gates twelve angels, and names written thereon, and the names of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel, on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, the south three gates, and on the west three gates, and the wall of the city had twelve foundations, uh, and in them the names of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. And he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city and the gates thereof and the wall thereof and the city lieth four square and the length is as large as the breadth and he measured the city with a reed twelve thousand furlongs and the length and the breadth and the height of it are equal and he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits according to the measure of a man that is uh, of the angel and the building of the wall of it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. And the foundations of the wall of the city were garnished with all manner of precious stones. Uh, the first foundation was jasper, the second sapphire, the third a chalcedony, the fourth an emerald, the fifth a sardonyx, the sixth sardius, the seventh a chrysolite, the eighth a beryl, the ninth a topaz, the tenth a chrysophrasis, the eleventh adjacent, and the twelfth an amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. And the street of the city was pure gold, as it were, transparent glass. All right, y'all get that? That's the blueprints. Well, let's break it down. Let's look at the insight that John gives us to this celestial city, the place where the bride of Christ is going to uh, abide with God forevermore. Uh, the first thing I want you to notice about this celestial city, it's found in verse number 10, it's full of God's glory. Look what it says. Having the glory of God. Now we have no idea what that is because we've never seen that. We've experienced some inklings of it. Sometimes God gets so big in our soul we just don't know what to do. Sometimes we weep, sometimes we shout, sometimes we run because God gets so big in our soul. But uh, uh, the glory of God in, in a service sometimes when His presence is so real and somebody gets born again, we get an inkling of the glory of God. Uh, when He hears and answers one of our prayers in one of our darkest moments and our emotions are overwhelmed and we can't control ourselves because of the goodness of God, that's an inkling of His glory. We're going to dwell in the full boat of His glory. You see, the reason we have to have a glorified body like Christ, we couldn't stand in His presence. To put it in comparison, the earth is lit up by the sun. The sun cannot compare to the glory and the brightness of God. So, if you want a glimpse of it, just go out and try and look at the sun for about an hour. Your eyeballs will melt out of your head. That's what the glory of God will do to you, huh? It's got the glory of God. As a matter of fact, as we'll find a little later, His glory lights the whole city. There is no sun. His whole glory lights the heavens and the earth. There's no more sun. There's no more moon. There'll be no more night. Because the glory of God will no longer be hidden. What a blessing. Notice something else about the celestial city. Uh, and by the way, 
In verse 10, it goes on to say that God's glory is like unto a stone most precious, like a jasper stone, clear as crystal. It has the brilliance of a diamond. If you look into a diamond under, that's been, you know, in a microscope, and you start seeing all the facets of the diamond, and, and I'm talking one of them high-quality ones, that it gives off all the colors. Well, that's just a small inkling of what God's glory is like. We have His glory. But it also mentions that this celestial city has 12 gates. Look in verse number 12. And a wall, great and high, and had 12 gates, and at the gates 12 angels, and names written thereon, which are the names of the 12 tribes of the children of Israel, and on the east three gates, and on the north three gates, south three gates, and on the west three gates. Now look with me down verse 21. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Every several gate was of one pearl. So we find that there are twelve gates. There's three on each side of this city. As you'll find out in a minute, this city is square. By my hillbilly math, you're going to find a gate about every 375 miles. Now, each one of these gates has a name. Each one is named after one of the twelve tribes of the children of Israel. One of them is going to be Naphtali, one Benjamin, one Dan, you know, all, all down through those twelve names. Reuben, all of them. They're going to be named after those twelve children of Israel. We find also that each gate is made of pearl. Can I say, pearl is the only precious stone that is formed rather than extracted. All precious jewels are extracted from the earth and they come about by intense heat and pressure. But not a pearl. A pearl comes about because of suffering. Uh, an oyster gets a little piece of grit or a little piece of fragment from the sea inside it, and it cannot get rid of it. Kind of like an eyelash in your eye and you can't get rid of it. And it irritates that oyster. That oyster begins to secrete mother of pearl over that grit and keeps doing it until it no longer irritates them. The oyster had to suffer in order for that pearl to be formed. My dear friends, in order for us to get to New Jerusalem, there had to be suffering. Jesus Christ suffered on Calvary, and everybody that goes through the gates of New Jerusalem will do so knowing they are entering there because of the suffering of the Lamb. We find also that these gates are guarded by angels. Why? Well, you will find, if we had time, we could look in Zechariah, we could look in Isaiah, we could look in Ezekiel, and it will mention a little bit uh, later on. But you see, the inhabitants of earth will come into... New Jerusalem to worship the Lamb uh, after uh, every time a certain tree will bear its fruit. But can I say, they won't come into New Jerusalem until it's that time. And that's for the bride. That's where the abode of God is. You remember those Jews that are going to be inheriting the earth and that great number of tribulation saints and all them that come through the tribulation, they didn't come by the, uh, the grace age like you and I. And so there are certain privileges afforded us because we believed on the Lord. We put our faith in Him. We didn't reject Him. We are His bride. So there's 12 angels guarding the gates. Okay? You'll only come in when you're invited. It's kind of like the king. 
in Bible times and really in history times. You didn't just approach the king. You came when you were summonsed or you didn't come. That was the danger of Esther. And she put on her, her, her queenly robes, but if the king didn't summons her, she wouldn't have got to the king to warn about uh, uh, wicked Haman and all that went. And when he took one glimpse and saw her, he motioned for her. And she got an audience with the king. Well, the same thing. You only have an audience with the king when the king wants you. And by the way, that's why it's a danger to keep putting off getting saved. You know, a lot of people have the mind, well, I'll get saved when, I, when I'm ready. Well, if you know you're a sinner and you know Jesus died for you and he's speaking to your heart, you better get saved now because you don't know that he'll ever summon you to get saved again. So we see there's 12 gates. But it also mentions there's a wall. Look with me in verse number 12 again. It says, And had a wall, great and high. Look at verse 14. And the wall of the city had twelve foundations, and in them the name of the twelve apostles of the Lamb. Look at verse 17. And he measured the wall thereof a hundred and forty and four cubits, according to the measure of a man, that is, of the angel. And of the building of the wall it was of jasper, and the city was pure gold like unto clear glass. Let's talk about the wall. And the Bible says it's great and high. 144 cubits. Just about everybody agrees. A cubit's 18 inches now. Some of the old commentaries said it could have been as much as 22 inches, but it's most commonly uh, agreed upon that a cubit is 18 inches. Matter of fact, if you go see the Ark Encounter, it was built on an 18-inch cubit. Okay? If cubits were 22 inches, it would have been bigger than what you see down there. But using 18-inch cubits and 144 cubits, it's 216 feet tall, just a wall, 216 feet high. We find in verse 18 that it's like a jasper stone. In other words, it is transparent. Can I help you with something? When you get to New Jerusalem, everything is transparent. There is no shadows. There is no night. The brightness of the Lamb is everywhere. There is nothing that is not transparent when you get to the city. Okay? The only thing not transparent is the foundations. We'll get to that in a minute. But that's under the city. Okay? But we see that uh, it's transparent. We also see that it is resting on 12 foundations. Look again at verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. So this wall is 216 feet high, and underneath it is 12 foundations. Now, Brother Ray was asking me for service, and I think I remember right. I don't, I don't know if I remember right because it's been 16 years and my memory isn't what it used to be, but he asked how deep the footer was on this building. I think it was three feet. I think it's three feet solid concrete underneath here, I think. But I'm not sure. He's saying, you sure it wasn't six feet? I don't think we paid for that much concrete. But anyway, we got a big foundation underneath this building. It's held up well for 16 years. There's 12 foundations under the city of New Jerusalem. Now, I know what I have written in my Bible. I have not been able to verify it, but somewhere, somehow, in the last 37 years, well, no, I've been preaching out of this Bible 32 years. Somewhere in this Bible, somewhere in my study, I found where each foundation was a mile and a half high. It's 18 miles, the foundation. I could not verify that today. But somewhere, somehow, I read that somewhere because I have it written in my Bible. So if that's the case, each foundation has the names of the apostles, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, all the way down to the last one, Paul. The apostles' names are in the foundations. And if they are a mile and a half high, that's each one of them is a mile and a half of nothing but precious stone. You talk about beautiful. Hmm? It has to have some kind of foundation to hold the city. But think about this. If it's 18 miles high of a foundation, and then you ascend and there's a 216-foot wall, 
and then the city's built on top of that and we're going to show you in a minute the city's 1500 miles high you're always ascending up to get to the lamb hmm uh, but I want to look at these foundations here for a minute Well, let me just show you this verse 14 for I can get to the foundations. Look at verse 14. And the wall of the city had 12 foundations, and in them the name of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. And then verse 15. And he, he that talked with me had a golden reed to measure the city, and the gates are up, and the walls are up. And the city lieth here, it is four square. And the length is as large as the breadth, and he measured the city with the reed, 12,000 furlongs. The length and the breadth and the height of it are equal. That means it's square. And if you're standing at one point, it's the same distance this way, the same distance this way, and it said the height, the same distance up. 12,000 furlongs, which is 1,500 feet. Or, I'm sorry, 1,500 miles. From New York City to Miami, Florida is only 1,280 miles. It's farther than that, the city. Now keep in mind the new earth won't have any sea. But it's going to be 1,500 miles this way, 1,500 miles this way, and 1,500 miles up. Big city. That's why it's got a big foundation. But let's look at these 12 foundations. It lists them beginning in verse 19 and through verse 21, or through verse 20, 19 and 20 mentions the 12 foundations. I read them a minute ago, Jasper, Sapphire, Chalcedony. We have all of these precious stones. Some of them are known today. Uh, some of them are aquamarine in color. Some of them are a golden color, like a, in, like a topaz kind of color. Uh, some of them are emeralds, and some of them are rubies, and some of them are sapphires, and some of them are diamonds. They're all precious some of them were mentioned and used in the breastplate of the high priest under the Old Testament. So we see that there are 12 of them. And if you've never heard that message I preached years and years ago, go get it on the 12 foundations of heaven. I kind of allude to these and, and preach on them. But I'm going to give you what these 12 foundations represent. But I want you to think for a minute. Over the gates are the names of the 12 tribes of Israel. On the foundations are the names of the apostles. We find that the 12 tribes of Israel represent the law, but the apostles represent grace. Without the law, we'd have never come to the knowledge of sin and known we were sinners, and without grace, we'd have never got to go to New Jerusalem, and they're both met in the Lamb. But let me give you these uh, foundations. and See, each one of these foundations represents something. You see, what it took for us to be saved and what heaven is built upon are things and attributes of our salvation and things that cause us to be excited when we come to church. Well, that's what it's all built on. Let me give you an example. First of all, Jasper represents the holiness of God. It's transparent. Without the holiness of God, we'd have no Savior. If Jesus wasn't holy and He had the same blood as we are, He couldn't save us. So Jasper represents the holiness of God. Sapphire, which is my birthstone, represents our heavenly character and position in Christ. We are robed in His righteousness right now. We are being... Uh, 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 or we are citizens of heaven right now, but we're citizens because of Christ. Uh, he's the one that bought our salvation, uh, and our position is in Christ. What a blessing. Uh, Brother Sidney Weaver's got a message on, and, and it's wonderful, about right now I'm in heaven, but I'm on earth. See, what you see is my practical, but my position is in heaven. I'm seated in Christ Jesus in heavenly places, the Bible says. Well, I'm not in heaven, but my position's in heaven. 
my practicals on earth. But one of these days, my practical is going to catch up with my position, and I'll be there. What a blessing. Hmm? Every time he says that, I told him, I gave that to him. I have given him some things, but I didn't give him that one. Hmm? But one of these days, our practical is going to catch up with our position. And it's all in Christ. And that's what sapphire represents. Chalcedony represents faith. For by grace you're saved through faith. That not of yourselves, it's the gift of God, not of works, lest any should boast. I'm not going to heaven because I prayed so much. I'm not going to heaven because I got baptized. I'm not going to heaven because I was a member of a church. I'm not going to heaven because I was a Baptist or any other denomination. I'm going to heaven because one day I realized I was lost. I was a sinner. And the only way I could get to heaven is put my faith in the finished works of Calvary, what Jesus done for me on the cross. And when I put my faith and I believed on the Lord and asked Him to save me, He saved me. It's a faith way. Hmm? Chalcedony represents faith. An emerald's green. They're beautiful. Emerald represents praise. Anytime you find green in the Bible, it always represents praise. And we'll have a whole lot to praise Him for when we get there, I promise you. Huh? Uh, you know, I know folks that kind of get around the way we worship. They get a little nervous. Well, they don't want to go to heaven. Everybody's going to be shouting their lungs out in heaven. Hmm? Uh, it's about praise. By the way, I mentioned it of emeralds. Most of them now are synthetic. If you can get a real one, it's really valuable. Hmm? Uh, uh, then we find sardonyx. Sardonyx is a, uh, represents the beauty and blessings of God. Boy, we rejoice in the blessings of God, do we not? Hmm? And all the things that God does is beautiful. Hmm? Uh, sardius. You know that is a ruby. That represents the blood. It's the red stone. There's nobody going without the shed blood of Calvary. Hmm? Without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. Jesus shed his blood to be the propitiation for our sins. We're going because of the blood of Christ. Then we find a chrysolite that represents our joy. The Bible says rejoice evermore. The Bible says the joy of the Lord's our strength. But can I say heaven's going to be a happy place? going to be happy, happy, happy. I promise you. And there'll be no more sorrow. We already read that to you. Hmm? Then there's beryl. Beryl represents righteousness. Hmm? It's a golden stone. Gold always represents righteous, righteousness. And now we're robed in His righteousness. And one of these days we'll put on that wedding garment and our righteousness will be seen and it'll reflect His holiness. Hmm? Then we find topaz. Topaz represents wisdom. Hmm? You know why God gave us a Bible? So we can know His statutes and His precepts. Hmm? We're to seek after wisdom. That's what the Solomon told us. That ought to be our goal, is to find wisdom in the things of God. Uh, can I say wisdom is knowledge tempered with experience? Every one of you, you remember when you was a teenager, your parents told you certain things to do, and you just thought they were old fuddy-duddies, and by the time about five years later, you got a little wisdom. You realize they're telling you the truth, huh? Don't do all that stupid stuff. You're going to pay for it, huh? Uh, I like chrysoprasis. Uh, it simply means regeneration. Hallelujah, we got born again. That's the only way you're going. Hmm? And then adjacent... That means forgiveness. Hallelujah. He forgave me of my sins. Hmm? And then the last one, amethyst. Uh, that is a beautiful stone. The amethyst represents the royal and regal, regal splendor to those who belong to God. We are of a royal priesthood, the Bible says. A peculiar people, a chosen generation. That amethyst is to remind us of what we are in Christ. What a blessing. So we see those foundations. There were some other things about the heavenlies. Notice the radiance in verse 22. And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And by the way, there you see them both. They're in New Jerusalem, called out by their given names, the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb. Look at verse 23. 
And the city had no need of sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. Look in chapter 22, verse 5. And there shall be no night there, and they need no candle, neither light of the sun, for the Lord giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and ever. What a blessing. There is a radiance of God's light everywhere. What a beautiful thing. Hmm? What a beautiful thing. By the way, can I just tell you this? There are a lot of things we don't know. There's a lot of things about heaven we won't know till we get there. There's a lot of things about the Bible we just don't understand, we can't put our finger on. But there are some things that we understand in the Scripture. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Mm -hmm. When your body takes its last breath, if you're saved, you immediately are in the presence of God. You're with the Lord. Now, there's been a lot of movies and a lot of books and a lot of things written that give contrary to Scripture. Well, anything that goes contrary to Scripture, I don't care how good and well-made and well-written it is, it's wrong. There was a whole series done on Left Behind that gives people a second chance to get born again after the rapture. That's not true. And go read Second Thessalonians chapter 2. You'll see that God brings strong delusion on you whether you believe a lie. But there's a lot of things I just don't understand them. There's a lot of things been written about people where they go and they, they find out things about things they shouldn't have ever known about and they said that they were with the Lord and then they came back to their body. I don't understand all that stuff. I don't. I just don't understand it. You know, everybody says, you know, when you die, go to the light. Well, I know one thing. It is a lightful place. I, I don't know all that stuff. People are all the time asking. There was that one uh, movie about that little boy who they lost him. And they brought him back to life, and then he's telling them all things about his grandpa, and all of a sudden he never met his grandpa. He said, how did all that happen, brother? I have no idea. I don't know. I don't know if while he's in that unconscious state, if God whispered in his ear, I don't know. But I know one thing, if his soul left his body, he was in heaven. You say, well, God would never put a soul back in a body. Don't tell that to Lazarus. I just don't understand some of that stuff. So don't come and ask me, you know, Brother Doug, is this right? Is it? I don't know. There's just some stuff I don't know. It's bigger than me. Hmm? All I can tell you is make sure you're born again, and when you meet Jesus, you can ask him. He'll tell you all that stuff. He's God. He can do whatever he wants to do, you know, and I'm fine with whatever what he wants because it says he does all things well. I don't know how he does all that stuff. I don't know. I just don't know. I don't know. But I knew, though, we're going to a radiant place. Hmm? Uh, notice there's a river. Look at chapter 22, verse 1. Now I'm almost done. I told you I had a lot tonight. Chapter 22, verse number 1 says, And he showed me a pure river of water, of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. There's a pure river, nothing in it defiled. If you're thirsty, you can take a drink. It'll be all right. And by the way, even if Brother James has his feet in it, because he'll be in a glorified body, you can still take a drink of it. It'll be all right. But why is there a river coming from the throne of God in New Jerusalem? Well, it represents the Holy Ghost. Mm -mm. There's just everything is representation of the work of God. There's a river. Notice, if you will, the... I had to do an R word, so I just did revitalization. Revitalization, revitalization is what I meant to say the first time. Look at chapter 22, verse 2. In the midst of the street of it on either side of the river was there the tree of life, which bare twelve manner of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree were for the healing of the nations. And we know Hebrews chapter 4 verse 9 tells us there remaineth therefore a rest to the people of God. We're going to rest from our labors. But we also know that heaven is all about new things. And this tree of life yields her fruit for the healing of the nations. And uh, 
to heal all the wounds of all the problems and all the things that Jesus came to right, all the wrongs. And so there's always, imagine a tree that bears its fruit every month. It's got to be heaven. Huh? Say, so preacher, explain all this. I have no idea. I just got to wait till we get there. I'm just giving you what John told us. But then notice, if you will, the recompense. And this is what makes it all wonderful. Without this, it wouldn't be, wouldn't be as glorious as what we've been describing. Look in chapter 21. Look at verse 27. And there shall in no wise enter into it anything that defileth, neither whatsoever worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. Now look in chapter 22, verse 3. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it, and His servants shall serve Him. There will be no more sin, no more curse. This world is cursed, been tainted by sin. Romans chapter 1 tells us that even all creation is groaning for the Lord to come back and right the wrongs. With the land we're going to, there's no more curse, nothing that will defile. If there is mosquitoes, they won't bite you. There won't be snakes, so you don't even have to think about that. It's not going to be there. But whatever's there is going to be perfect. And by perfect, in a sense of the word that we don't even know, there'll be nothing there to defile. Nothing there. There'll be anything less than holy. We get to dwell there forever now there's a lot of people say preacher what are we going to do I have no idea I know we're going to worship him I know we're going to have a wonderful time I know everything is going to be absolutely outstanding in every facet of the word we'll reunite with our loved ones that went on we'll meet the saints of old You'll have a glorified body you won't have to eat, but if you want to eat, there's trees that bear fruit. There'll be an absolute array of things around the Lamb, and we'll rejoice forevermore. I don't know about you, but I love to come to church when it gets on. That's every day in heaven. And there's only one day in heaven. It never ends. Hmm. So if you're looking for a place for the Lord to break out, it'll be wherever you look. And it'll be wonderful. And it'll be glorious. And it'll be worth every mile, every trial, every heartache, every heartbreak, every problem, every mountain, Every, every thorn, thistle, and whatever we face in this life. The Bible says that the sufferings of this present time are not worthy to be compared to the glory which shall be revealed in us. Your worst day here won't even be a memory there. It'll be worth it all. The bottom line is we can rejoice in knowing this awaits. We can take refuge in the fact that we win. When John saw the bride, the Lamb's wife, if you're born again, he's already saw you in heaven. We win. That's playing out right now. And some days we don't feel like winners. But we win. And so... That's why the Bible says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith. See, if you're looking unto Him, guess what? You're not looking around at all the mess in this world. Because you get to looking around all this mess, you're going to get all jacked up. But you keep your eyes on Him, knowing what awaits. I don't care what you're going through. You'll find peace and comfort. You'll find strength. You'll find hope. 
Paul and Silas were beat to within an inch of their life. They're in prison. They're chained. Knowing the next day they're probably going to be behead, beheaded. They just broke out and singing. A little prayer meeting. God showed up. The rest is history. Philippian jailer got saved in his whole house. So what are you trying to say, preacher? That was a bad day for the Apostle Paul. Beaten 39 times. Your back laid open. You're thrown in the inner prison in a dungeon with nothing but muck and mire and rats. You talk about infection setting in. He's faced with all that, and all he could do is start singing, Oh, how I love Jesus. And you can tell he wasn't a Baptist. Baptist had been complaining, moaning, blaming God for everything. You promised me nothing bad ever happened. No, he never promised you that. What I'm saying is, when your perspective about your position is right, your practical will propel you through whatever you're facing. No, it wasn't easy on the Apostle Paul, but the Lord showed up. And he's no respecter of persons. If he showed up for Paul, he'll show up for you, as long as your perspective's right. Paul wasn't having a pity party. He was having a prayer and praise party. Isaiah 61, 3, there's a garment of praise for the spirit of heaviness. I promise you, next time you're having a bad day, you start singing a good old hymn, or you got to get to singing a good old song, the Lord is my shepherd, guess what? Business will pick up in your life too. I've proven it. Hmm? But seeing that this awaits us, we've got to live different. We ought to respond different. We ought to speak different. We ought to carry ourselves different. Anybody ever seen that movie coming to America? It's worldly, but anybody ever see it? They're coming out with part two. Eddie Murphy's gotten fat. In that movie, he's portraying uh, an immigrant that has come here to go to college. He doesn't have anything. He's working at a makeshift McDonald's. The daughter of the owner makes a comment to him. She says, there's something about you. You're almost regal. And he starts chuckling because he really is a prince. What well, can I say? Your circumstances ought to not overshadow the fact that you are a son of God. You are a daughter of God. There ought to be a regalness about you. Don't get me wrong, not an arrogance, a regalness. People ought to know that you don't belong in this world. They ought to see something different in you. The indictment over, over about the church the last 30 years is most people that go to church act just like the world. No wonder the world don't want what we have. They ought to see something different. They ought to see a love. Jesus said, this is how the world know you that you're my disciples, that you have love one for another. They ought to see a love amongst God's people that they don't see anywhere else in this world. That ought to be a godly love. So seeing that this is unfolding, it ought to propel us to live a life that shows people where we're headed. If you're here today and your life isn't emulating that, you ought to get right with God tonight. Because there are people watching your life. The Bible says we're written epistles known and read of all men. There are people watching your life. They ought to see Jesus. If you're here tonight you don't know if you're saved, you ought to get that settled tonight. If you're here tonight and you, you know you're not saved, you ought to get saved tonight. If you're here tonight and you're not living right, you ought to get right. Because I'm here to tell you, this is not that far away. What we've been talking about, the rapture of the church could happen right now. We could be in the abode of God tonight. Hmm? Then the great tribulation is going to be seven years. Then we'll come back for a thousand years. Then we're going to, But can I say, a thousand years with the Lord is a day and a day, a thousand years. When you're with Him, it don't matter how much time, but we could be with the Lord tonight. But we're headed to this place. We're headed to this land. We're headed to this city. Are you ready? That's the only thing that matters. Are you ready? That you know, that you know, that you know, that you know. You're ready. That your name's written in that Lamb's Book of Life. 
that he's gone to prepare a place for you. There's a mansion with your name on it. Phil sings that song, I've got a clear title to a mansion. Do you got that? You ought to know that tonight. And all the stuff we don't understand, God's going to fill all that in. You'll be satisfied. What's important is that you know that you're ready. If you're not, I'd get ready tonight. Let's all stand, Brother Clint. Come get a song of invitation. <coughs> well, they're picking out a song. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, we love you. Our little pea brains can't even facet what you've gone to prepare. We can't even grasp the splendor and the beauty. Just the little picture of what John gives blows our minds away. Lord, what is most humbling is that we really get to go. Lord, we don't deserve to even be able to call upon your name, let alone to dwell with you forevermore. Lord, I'm just glad we get to go. Lord, I pray if there's any in our midst tonight that's not ready to go. Maybe they're not living right. Maybe they're not acting right. Maybe they're not right. Lord, I pray they'd get right tonight. Those that are ready to go, I pray that, Lord, you'd put so much of you on them that they would lead somebody else. They'd show somebody else the way so others, too, can enjoy this wonderful, wonderful place you've gone to prepare. Help us to live in light of that city. Help us to live in light of the love of God. And Father, we'll certainly make a difference in somebody's life. Father, have your will and way down this invitation. Speak to hearts. And Father, we'll bless you for it. For it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Did you know that IBC is now on iTunes, TuneIn, SoundCloud, and Google Play? Head on over to your podcast provider and subscribe today. And as always, thanks for listening.